Good morning and or good afternoon, um, depending on where you're calling in from and which part of the world you're calling in from. My name is Claudine Fair. I am the outgoing chair of the AIAA Diversity Working Group, and I'm excited to present um, the Doc Mary Jackson um, name lecture. The Mary Jackson name lecture is it give it in honor of Mary Jackson, who was the one, one who was the first Black aerospace engineer at NASA. Um, the lecture, this lecture is jointly hosted um, by the Royal Aeronautical Society and the AIAA Diversity Working Group. This year's lecture features Dr. Sonia Smith, who, like Mary Jackson, is the first Black female in a number of different era aerospace fields. Professor Jacks, Professor Smith um, is a mechanical engineering and inter, um, professor at Howard University and is the interim executive director of Research um, Institute for Tactical Autonomy. Um, Dr. Smith obtained her PhD in mechanical engineering, mechanical and aerospace engineering from the University of Virginia and was the first African-American to do so. Dr. Smith is a faculty member of Howard University's Mechanical Engineering Department and is a member of a number of different societies, including um, being a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Science, um, Sigma Pi. Um, she was a MLK visiting professor um, in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT. She is a fellow with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers um, and is an associate fellow in, within AIAA. Um, she is a member or she was elected president of um, Women in Engineering and she also belongs to American Physical Society um, as well as the Amer um, American Society for Engineering Education, Sci the Society of Women Engineers, and the National Society of Black Engineers. So I apologize for my stumbling. I am fanning out right now. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Smith um, and all of her work. Um, I'm really excited to present to you today, um, Dr. Smith, and she will um, be presenting on um, she will be presenting on um, thermal blankets and aerospace applications, and um, we ask that you all hold your questions to the end. So, without further ado, I'm so excited to present to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudine. And I will uh, share my screen. Uh, please confirm that you can see the screen and not the uh, not the notes page. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Thank you very much for that kind, kind introduction. Um, you will be on tap for my obituary for sure. Um, so the title of my talk is Blankets to 2D Materials, uh, Thermal Management Strategies for Aerospace Applications. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you a little bit about my institution, Howard University. Um, we are located in Northwest Washington, DC, and we're consistently named as the number one producer of African-Americans that go, undergraduates that go on to earn their PhDs in STEM fields. This is going to be important for part two of the talk uh, later on. Um, this is um, us at a glance, uh, two campuses, 13 schools and colleges. But we, in engineering, we offer the bachelor's and master's degree um, in all fields. And aerospace is an option in mechanical, so it's more of a blended department. My view from within um, the field is that I've been a faculty member for 25 years, served as department chair. My connection to Mary Jackson and NASA Langley is that um, I worked for two contractors uh, prior to graduate school, um, and I was and they were at NASA Langley. I was seated actually on the um, on the base campus there. I'm also uh, a NASA graduate research fellow, um, and so NASA paid for my education, so I have a, a 
connection there. I've worked with uh, our NSF Advance. I led that, which is NS the Advance program is a program by NSF that works to um, increase the number of women faculty in the STEM fields. And the other accolades you heard from um, you heard from uh, Claudine, and I won't go over those, but I want to say that I have a unique perspective, both technically and also as a woman in STEM and a, a unique connection to uh, Mary Jackson as well. So the talk is gonna be in two parts today. Um, first is gonna be the technical part. I'm gonna talk about the hot, which is battery thermal management and the cold and material properties at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and part two will be the state of women in, in engineering, and then I'll conclude the remarks and take questions. So uh, the thermal management, battery thermal management piece of this um, grew out of a program called POETS, a power optimization for electrothermal systems. This is an engineering research center funded by NSF, which is a, a consortium of Howard University, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign is the lead, uh, Stanford and University of Arkansas. And this is my uh, former student who did this work. So as you know, electrification is a mega trend and it um, hits aerospace um, and not only off and on highway um, vehicles, power tools, et cetera. And you see that the growth is um, almost exponential in terms of um, battery operated vehicles and hybrid vehicles. The thermal management piece is important both for safety and for performance. So uh, not only, you know, we see a lot about the um, EV batteries um, overheating and causing uh, dangerous fires, but also for the um, photo at the top is the JAXA plane that had the um, battery uh, fire within the cargo hold. So this is a, this is an important, uh, it's an important issue uh, for both um, EVs and also um, and aerospace electric um, electric aircraft. So um, just as a kind of quick background, the battery ratings um, are rated and used as up C units. So um, and a C one C battery is is charged from zero to one hundred percent in one hour. So a battery rated one C is going to be that it's fully charged. Um, it's going to be a, a, that a fully charged battery rated at one amp hour should charge one ampere for one hour. So that's important because as we look, um, and I'm using the um, I'm using the EV uh, example here for driving, but this also applies to electric aircraft. We really want to be able to recharge these um, batteries quickly, all right, and that has an implication for heating as well. So. Um, the fast charge, we really would like to get to the extra fast charge where we can charge these, recharge quickly and go. And so again, that has implications for the heat that is generated within that battery pack, be it for aircraft or for electric vehicle. So the most common types of um, battery thermal management are active or can be classified as active or passive. And in the active case, we have uh, the forced air cooling where you uh, blow um, air or, or have some liquid going over the batteries. You can have liquid cooling where you have the direct contact cooling like immersive cooling or indirect contact through um, different channels. For the passive side, we can have heat uh, heat pipes, which are you know basically conduction mechanisms. But the interesting piece here that we're going to talk about later is incorporating phase change materials. So that's a material that has a high latent um, heat and that it can absorb a lot of um, energy in the form of heat um, before it um, liquefies. And so this is going to this is going to become important later. So our performance metrics that we're looking for, again, is increased um, battery efficiency. So um, if you look, remember the space station uh, replaced its 48 nickel hydrogen batteries with 24 lithium ion batteries. So, um, and the lithium ion batteries weighed 400 pounds on earth. And this increased the battery efficiency and, and increase in energy density to store more energy in a similar space. Um, this has implications for our um, electric vehicles, be they aircraft or um, or um, our cars, 
um, off-road and, hi and highway in that we have extended range. So, you know, if you have increased en energy density, we can store more energy into a smaller space, extend mobility and range and fast charging. But again, all this has implications on the thermal management piece for safety. Okay. So, um, just as an example for the EV batteries for the charge time right now, you see why the lithium ion battery is very um, popular because it has one of the higher specific energy and specific and uh, specific power and one of the lower uh, charge times and discharge rates. So for us, uh, we uh, did a systems analysis on the heat generate uh, for different uh, packs at um, different C rates. And we looked at the radio and axial thermal conductivity and temperatures. And um, in conjunction with our partners at University of Illinois, we are evaluating the performance of our new design uh, for the within a full system. So the specifications for the cells that we were using were the Samsung cells, um, um, commercial off the shelf parts. And these are the various heat generation rates corresponding for it in this example for a vehicle for normal conditions, uphill and extreme conditions. And for us, we wanna increase, uh, increasing the cells in, in a parallel configuration increases the capacity and increasing the cells in a series configuration increases the voltage. And so in order to cool that, because this is the cooling case, we propose a hybrid uh, battery thermal management system that takes advantage of the liquid cooling uh, in the indirect contact by having your uh, refrigerant or coolant going through um, channels and also the phase change material. So combining these, we think that we can, well, we have demonstrated that we can remove more heat and keep the battery cell, which you'll see later in the safe zone. And this is the place where the um, innovation and in, uh, in 2D materials like graphene and others come into play. Because what you'll see later is that, as I said before, the materials, um, once they saturate, liquefy, then they stop working. But if you can design a material that um, has a higher latent heat and it can absorb more, um, absorb more energy, that would be definitely desirable. And you can keep your pack um, within the safe zone for a longer uh, period of time. And that's ongoing research in my lab um, that I will not get a chance to, to talk about today, but I did want to mention that. Um, we're also using uh, the pyrolytic graphite sheets as well as a conduit. So how all this fits together is this way. So we're using um, the our novel a hybrid battery management system. And we're modeling this, including a um, phase change composite, a cooling tube and a pyrolytic uh, graphite sheet for testing under various heat generation conditions. And so you see the wavy pattern <laughs> um, for the channels here. Um, the, the pyrolytic graphite sheets are introduced to form a thermal conductive network for the phase change composite based battery pack module. The wavy patterns that are in contact with the cells are designed specifically to extract as much heat from the radial surface as possible. And so to improve the battery thermal management systems heat removal process, the pyrolytic graphite sheets are integrated into the wavy design to help increase the heat rate to the cooling medium. It's a <clears throat> isometric view of the model of our battery pack um, here. Our governing equations are basically energy conservation and the boundary conditions are making sure that the, uh, the heat in and out match at each of the boundaries. We did a mesh independent study uh, showing that the intermediate mesh <clears throat> uh, would perform well and actually performs uh, a little bit better than the uh, fine mesh. Our simulation parameters are set here with the heat inlets and outlets and the heat uh, loads and temperatures uh, going in and out. And as I said before, um, 
with this hybrid thermal management system that we've designed, um, we can get, so the five, the three C here was approaching the fast charging. It's not complete fast charging, but it was approaching that. Um, we can keep this within the safe zone for um, an hour. And we feel that our next result will show that with the <clears throat> uh, manipulated phase change materials and new materials using integrated 2D materials at scale, that um, we will be able to increase uh, this uh, uh, safe zone to move this curve uh, down here below with the uh, lower seas and, and increase the, uh, the time in which we have the maximum safe temperature. Uh, temperature uniformity is important in battery uh, in battery cells to make sure that there's uh, thermal that we mitigate thermal runaway, and we see that even at the higher uh, temperatures, we keep the cells pretty much uniform. The maximum difference in the cells in the temperatures is less than five C for all of them, which is uh, within the operating range. And of course, um, as we increase our uh, velocity, as we increase our um, as we increase our C rate, we also increase uh, the pumping power as required. But again, if we um, that's due to the fact that our uh, base change material is saturating, and as we um, design better materials for that, um, we expect the pumping power to decrease as well. So for this part, for the heating uh, piece, our improved uh, we have improved temperature uniformity. We reduced the maximum temperature and pre prevented cell failure. Uh, propagation through the surrounding cells with the phase change composite. Um, we've analyzed the cooling behavior under uh, various loads, and we were able to demonstrate that we can keep the, um, the required pumping power to the cells under the recommended operating temperature. So now let's turn to the cold. So it's not only, you know, thermal management is not only cooling, but it's also sometimes heating and making sure that your materials can operate um, within a uh, cool environment. So let's talk a little bit our, about our cryogenic mater uh, materials. My student that worked on this is uh, Kirsten Lovelace, which is shown here. And we're proposing to use uh, sapphire and silicon nitride as the uh, substrate uh, materials um, for to, um, to enhance reliability due to the cryogenic cycling that happens particularly in, uh, in uh, electronic packaging for space missions. So, you know, we have the typical substrate shown here in our PCB uh, board, but the problem is, is that because the materials are different um, due to the different environments, basically um, ascent, descent, and in, space and in the space environment, uh, thermal cycling causes um, a difference in the thermal expansion for the different materials. So, um, and that can lead to electronics failure. So the, um, most of the materials differ here, differ <clears throat> um, in their thermal expansion. And this is just shown here. And these are the common materials that are used um, for uh, PCB, for our electronic materials. And what you can see here is that um, the coefficient of thermal expansion is different. And so the most metals are going to expand in a large amount and the ceramics have the lower values and the polymers have the large expansion values of, of the both with values in the in hundreds. So if we look at these material values with respect to microelectronic packaging and their placement, you can see that from a numerical perspective that these materials are going to expand and contract at different rates when subjected to the same thermal environment. And this is what we're calling CTE mismatch and mismatch. And that is the acronym here, CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion. So um, these are just a demonstration of the material properties for typical um, microelectronic packages. We have um, materials used in microelectronic packaging. We have um, the coefficient of thermal expansion, dielectric constant, and thermal, and thermal conductivity, and you see the variation in all of them. Um, <clears throat> and so over the past 50 years, the silicon and copper have dominated the substrate and PCB materials for microelectronic packaging. But um, what we propose, but you can see here that there's a huge difference in the um, 
material properties, particularly uh, conductivity and coefficient of thermal expansion. So we're proposing to use silicon nitride and sapphire as the PCB substrate materials instead of the traditional materials. There's a shortage of public, however, there's a, a shortage of our published cryogenic data for many of the materials below 50 Kelvin and silicon nitride and sapphire are one of them. So the reason for silicon nitride is that it's mechanically robust, it's thermally stable, it's shock resistant, has great insulator and dielectrics. Um, as noted here shown, um, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, performed a successful on-orbit verification of the ceramic thruster, which was made out of silicon nitride, and the silicon nitride ball bearings showed a 40% um, gain in runtime in comparison to the steel with critical improvements. Um, and previously, before this experiment, NASA also uh, used the uh, silicon nitride ball, uh, ball bearings, changed those out um, on the space shuttle. So we wanted to model the coefficient of thermal expansion using the strain gauge method and develop uh, cryogenic data for our silicon uh, nitride at 4K. So this was our uh, experimental setup. We had a, um, a doer in which we submerged the uh, test sample shown here. We, um, and our cryogen is here. We are able to use liquid nitrogen and liquid helium, uh, liquid nitrogen, uh, the liquid helium is the one that gets us down to 4K. Um, and this is, next is just a, uh, a uh, picture of the actual uh, setup in the lab. But the important part is we use the strain gauge method to measure the coefficient of thermal expansion. The basic principle we are well, all engineers, we know that we use uh, two well-matched strain gauge sensors that are bonded to the test specimen and a reference sample of any size. And when the gauges are unstressed, the differential output between the gauges on the two specimens at any common te temperature is gonna be equal to the differential unit expansion. So when the change in temperature occurs, a change in resistance also occurs and is amplified here by the um, unbalancing of our quarter bridge Wheatstone circuit consisting of a, a, the series of resistors. So the results here, show that um, for the uh, cryogenic uh, tests for sapphire, we conducted those between 5.7K and 31 Kelvin. And this was achieved with the liquid helium. So the coefficient of thermal expansion for the sapphire under 50 Kelvin are relatively lower than the silicon nitride, um, which is agreeable with other ceramic materials. The ex and the experimental data here follows the trend of the um, theoretical data and has a mean standard deviation of uh, 4% and an error percentage of 4%. Similarly, this uh, this is a result, similar result for silicon nitride. Again, the experimental data still follows the trend of the theoretical data and the theoretical data came from NIST, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology here in the US. And it has a mean standard deviation of 8% and a mean error of 5.7%. So when you look at both of the test materials on the same graph with the same temperature range, you can see that from this experiment, the data is in close agreement with the NIST data. And it not only proves the overall accuracy of the data within this temperature range, but it confirms that these materials share similar CTE values, coefficients of thermal expansion at cryogenic materials, and so it supports their use in our deep space applications. And in addition, when you compare the traditional PCB materials, the, the coefficient of thermal expansion and the proposed, you see this difference is um, illustrated here uh, very well. So it shows that our silicon nitride and sapphire are more likely to reduce the thermal stresses in our microelectronic packaging uh, systems while increasing their performance and reliability. So um, in summary here, um, we wanted to experimentally test the coefficient of thermal expansion for silicon nitride and sapphire within the cryogenic temperature range to support its use in our um, microelectronic packaging systems for deep, deep space applications. 
We were able to calculate the CTE values for silicon nitride and sapphire at the temperatures less than 50 Kelvin with um, the lowest temperature <clears throat> obtained at 5.7 Kelvin. And um, so the lowest, the values at the lowest temperature obtained, which was 5.7 Kelvin, was 1.35 uh, 1 per Kelvin and 0.99 parts per million per Kelvin, respectively. So this again supports it, our, our proof of concept theory that this is these two materials can decrease the thermal stresses due to CTE mismatch and increase the performance and reliability. Um, and these experimental values again are comparable to the NIST um, the NIST calculations with a less than six percent mean standard deviation and mean error percentage. So. I want to pivot here uh, from the technical to, I don't think I could give a Mary Jackson lecture without addressing uh, why engineering, aerospace engineering particularly, is consistently one of the disciplines producing the fewest number of women engineers. So I want to take a little bit of my time uh, to discuss this. And the data that I'm going to present is based on the U.S., but if we see that the bachelor's degrees awarded in um, aerospace engineering 2020, that was the last uh, year in which uh, data was available, um, it's 25, uh, 20, a little over 23,000. But if you look at the bachelor's degrees uh, awarded to women um, in that same year, it's only a 14.9%. And yes, we're better than, slightly better than computer and electrical engineering, but I think at aerospace engineering, given the opportunities, you know, we, we can really do better. Um, again, this is based on US data. I'm sure the data is uh, very similar in the, um, in the UK and the EU. But if we look at the number of master's degrees awarded um, by engineering discipline, uh, not many, we're not awarding many master's uh, master's degrees, but we're at 18% for women. Um, we're better than mechanical, so that is something, but you know, nothing to really be proud of. And in doctoral degrees, I think you're getting the trend that we're consistent, consistently on the right tail end of these numbers when it comes to women. And we have to say, well, why is that the case? But if we look further at the number of percentage of women employed by engineering discipline, you see that um, we're right at about 14.1%. Um, yes, um, we're better than chemical and mechanical and electrical, but still I think the opportunities with aerospace, we can, uh, we can do better. So, um, and in addition to that, the dismal numbers is that there are 38 African-American women full professors in the US. And that is among the 13,910 full professors total in the US. So it's not only um, employed by discipline, but also where we are, we have a lot of work to do. And so I suggest that the reason why we have so few women are perception, the interdisciplinarity of aerospace engineering and also the climate and culture. So the perception is, is that um, I don't think that uh, it's a perception of engineering, and this is stemming from, I want to uh, go to this quote. I'm from a per African American engineering graduate, and she says that what ultimately led her to the business school and a non-engineering job was a lack of a viable career path advancement within the engineering organizations. So it's not the aerospace engineering industry at large, it's within the organizations where she worked. And she said, in addition to that, most engineering or organizations have promotion and leadership funnels that are very, very narrow. So the perception that this is not for me as a woman, as an African-American woman in engineering is there. And, and so there's room to improve. It's also the interdisciplinarity of aerospace engineering. Many of us come, from, come to aerospace engineering from uh, different worlds, from uh, physics, from uh, computer science. So it's very interdisciplinary. And it may be the case that we're not getting the word out to the other disciplines that yes, you can, you know, this is a place for you uh, to enter um, engineering. 
So it's also the climate and culture. You know, um, we do a lot with implicit bias, um, macro and microaggressions, uh, marginalization here, all of these things. And I think that um, there's an awareness of this as a problem within uh, aerospace engineering, but you know, there's also a lot of work to be done. Uh, just to talk about mar marginalization, this comes from uh, <clears throat> a, uh, a study that was done by the mechanical engineering department at MIT, but it also reflects other departments as well. I know uh, firsthand and also uh, from other disciplines. So that some women noted that they were asked to teach lower level undergraduate subjects rather than the specialized graduate subjects relating to their own research. And it changed their teaching assignments more often than their male peers, making it more difficult to focus on their research. So, you know, so that is an issue as well. So what I'm proposing is that um, we adopt some of the um, principles from the things that have been, choose, have been shown to work. So um, in the EU and uh, UK, we have the Athena Swan Initiative, uh, which and has been modeled in the US by the AAAS called Sea Change. Um, NSF Advance and uh, the Gender e Engineering Dean's Gender Equity Initiative from ASEE. All of these have specific metrics for STEM in general, for STEM degrees. But I think we need something specific for aerospace engineering. And why? Because aerospace engineering awards many engineering undergraduate degrees that we've shown but we have the lowest percentage of women. And an increase in our in aerospace engineering not only improves the profession, but it also has an outside effect on the number of women in engineering generally. We have a long way to go and we have a, a long bit of improvement that we can that we can make. And improving that will impact engineering as a whole. Um, and we can combat climate and culture problems through a climate survey, many of those things are underway and we should include, make sure that we don't forget about the HBCUs and MSIs, but in particular HBCUs, because they're in the US, there are two HBCUs that have um, actual, one has a aerospace engineering program, that's Tuskegee um, University. And one has an aviation program, that's Hampton University. All the others have um, aerospace in a blended department like mine. And so we need to, if we're going to um, increase the number of women, we've got to reach, we've got to go to all corners and reach women um, at these types of institutions as well. So with that, I want to thank you for your, um, for your attention. And I also want to acknowledge uh, my lab, my students, and the uh, Poets uh, Center uh, that I'm a part of. And uh, thank you very much. And I will take your questions. I see there are two in the chat. Um, two questions. So the first one is that with regard to degrees, do you put electronic and electrical? I studied electrical and electronic engineers. Um, yeah, I, I just, for this one, um, Kirsty, I just repeated the data as it was um, presented from ASEE. And so I think they grouped those together. Uh, the second question is um, from Daniel, do you think the pushback on and bad faith, but effective weaponization of DAIC in the States and to an extent the UK will have a meaningful impact on women and minorities joining and staying in the engineering field. That's a very good, that's a very good question. Um, I think that, I think that it probably, it, it may have, it may have an impact to the extent that it affects the um, will of um, institutions to combat uh, climate and culture problems within their organizations. I think, um, you know, people talk a lot about the pipeline issue and it's one thing to have a good pipeline but you know it's we definitely have to do reten we retention is the key because we can push a lot of people into the into the pipeline but if we don't retain them it's just uh as they say a revolving door so i think to the extent that um that uh 
uh, I guess, pushback on DEI initiatives prevents organizations from combating climate and culture will have that effect, not only on people going into the field, but staying. Um, there's one, can you talk about the phase change materials you are looking at for the hybrid? Would the environment affect your choice? Absolutely. Um, so the phase change materials, all of them, um, Janine, are basically um, wax-based. So the ones we were using, um, the off-the-shelf Rubitharm 42. And the 42 is the um, the temperature uh, um, the temperature at which um, the uh, the 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 melting temperature the wax melts or you know fails. So to the extent, so what you'd really like is something that will be able to maintain its structure and continue to absorb heat. Um, beyond that, maybe at a higher temperature. So one of the desired, as we're looking at um, making our own and designing our own temperatures, I mean, our own uh, phase change materials is something that may have a higher or lower uh, phase change uh, temperature. And yes, um, for for EVs and spacecraft, so it, it is it does affect the choice because um, getting back to the spacecraft, um, you have that cycling of temperatures, you have to, you have the survivability, you know, on your whatever ride you're taking up, be it a you know SpaceX or whatever, and then operations. So there, there's a different range of temperatures that you have to uh, plan for than you do for e EVs. Um, all right, I think. Uh, do you think? I think I've answered all the questions. Um, I would like more of my team to see this. Um, it is, re I think it, it is recorded by um, AIAA and by the uh, Royal Aeronautics Society. Um, and do you have, the last one, Daniel, do you have a recommendations in trade study and down selection techniques for novel materials? Um, my students, I, I don't have a recommendation um, because at the, for novel, is this, is Daniel, is this for the, I, I assume this is for the phase change materials. Um, we did this um, as part of, as part of the research. I don't have a recommendation um, for a trade study in that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Phase change materials. That's what I thought. Okay. Thanks. And so I think that is the last of the questions. Uh, oh, there was another one. Um, okay. I thought I saw, I think that was the last of the questions. Well, thank you very much uh, for your attention and the interactive questions. I really appreciate it. And um, I will turn it over. I'll end my screen now and stop sharing. And I will turn it over to Akila for closing remarks and um, instructions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Um, good morning, afternoon, uh, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, my name is Akilia Moxon Black. Um, I'm an equity, diversity, and inclusion officer. Um, and I'm here representing the Royal Aeronautical Society who hosts this event alongside the AIAA. Um, it's my pleasure to give the kind of vote of thanks and closing remarks on behalf of the Royal Aeronautical Society's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, so first of all, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Sonny Smith um, for an inspiring and thoughtful presentation. Um, your contribution insights have definitely increased our knowledge understanding and appreciation of the work you're doing. Um, and I particularly value where you spoke about the initiatives that promote and support women in aerospace. Um, I admire the goal of, of trying to bring more women into the industry. I think it's imperative for us to emphasize the importance and responsibility of fostering an inclusive culture. Um, and that's kind of a collective effort that permeates every level of, of the Royal Aeronautical Society. 
Um, just a little bit about our Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. It's embedded within the society structure. We're not only the sponsors, but the strategists behind the society's commitment to equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, our work involves collaborating closely with the society's branches, specialist groups, boards and committees on their ED and I related work to ensure that progress is being made across the society. And as a professional body, the society also wants to make sure that ED&I is being promoted across aviation, aerospace and space industry. So to do this, we do host um, several events just like this lecture, um, as well as produce a lot of material uh, in the form of articles, blog posts and podcasts. So if anyone is interested in finding out what the society um, does uh, under their ED&I initiatives, then you can go to aerosociety.com slash diversity to find out more. Um, but in closing, we're delighted and honoured to work in association with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics to present this lecture. Um, and together, I think we can continue to kind of break those barriers that you were talking about, Sonia, and build a more inclusive future in aerospace. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Smith, for, uh, the, le for the lecture and everyone uh, for joining us today. We, we look forward to, to hosting the Mary Jackson lecture next year. Uh, so thank you very much.